I turn to my right and see uh, two friends from the NFL Media Group uh, here. Half of the Around the NFL podcast uh, that has become so popular at, uh, at our office up the 405 here in Southern California. Greg Rosenthal and Chris Wessling. Good to see you here on the Rich Eisen Show. Thanks for having us, Rich. You got you, it. You were our first uh, guest on the Around the NFL podcast. Do you know that? Three or four um, episodes in. Is that right? I did not and know And more that. importantly, I think with your sway, you got that. Sway? St- yeah, at the NFL Network. I mean, you know. Now let's get you into got that this. studio Juice. built. You got that studio built, and you didn't stay there doing the podcast there forever. But if it wasn't for you building that studio, I don't know, I don't know if we'd the, be here. The podcast out of which this show was born. Right. Um, it, it, I have not been in the studio in a very long time. Uh, is the Rich Eisen podcast banner hanging from there in the same way that Dion's banner is hanging in the house that he built in Atlanta? <laughs> I think it it's there? mostly decorated by Damashek. Yeah, Damashek Dam- ripped all your stuff down. <laughs> we would have kept it. There's a terrible, there's a terrible or something. Yeah, there's a terrible towel hanging from the Raptors. 66 jersey, Mario Lemieux. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. it's funny. Uh, Dan Hanzus and Mark Sessler are going to be uh, the other uh, two. I shouldn't say that, but the, uh, the, the, the two that rounds out the quartet, they're going to be on the show next week. And it's funny, uh, on... On uh, vacation last week, I just texted you, Greg, to say, hey, can you, how about you guys come on? And here you are, day one. I mean, we show up. You we're show not, up. We're not divas. You're- I know there's some other <laughs> NFL media talent that's like that. Daniel Jeremiah, for one, I know. That's true. He's tough. Well, I had to give him a five-day letter. Otherwise, he, uh, <laughs> he, you know, he would never be able to show up here. Okay, so uh, you guys have watched an absurd amount of preseason football. Have you seen pretty much every snap of preseason football so I'll, far? I'll Chris? fade away on some of the fourth quarters and the third okay, quarters. Right. And when it gets to be a little too much Samaj P. Ryan and Ryan Griffin, <laughs> you know, these guys who never see a snap in a regular season game because right. they can't make the defender miss or they just can't make the throws. Right. So that's when you realize you're not watching NFL football anymore. Okay, so then what would you say? Because we are obviously mm. stuck in the helmet Zeke Elliott vortex right now. Uh, with Brown, what's the story of the preseason, if there is one, through the first two weeks, Chris West? Well, I would say that Sean McVay has started this thing where nobody plays their starters. Yeah. So it's rare to see actual NFL football in the preseason. And three or four years ago, I don't think that was the case. You would still see starting quarterbacks playing a, a full half. And now you'll see three or four games in a row where you rarely see a starter. So does that mean we're going to see choppy play in weeks one and week two again? I think we've already seen that the last few years. Maybe that's why the offenses have been so far ahead of the defenses to start the season, Mm -hmm. because you're not getting as much of the hitting and the timing down on defense. I I love that McVay did it. It makes our lives easier because it used to be a little bit of week one, week two and week three. You really have to crank through all that. The Rams didn't play any starters last year. And now there's about five or six teams, I think, that are going that route. And even the teams that do play the starters, it's only for a quarter or two. And if you look at kind of how the Rams did it, the Patriots a little bit last year, even week one, they'll warm up into the season by playing their guys 30, 40 snaps. I think it's the sports science guys in the building. If you look at the Jaguars, for instance, who had a ton of injuries, they were the team that always did like, you know, padded practices twice a day, going crazy. Now they're the total opposite. They don't play any of their guys in the preseason at all. So has anybody flashed, like, for real, though, that, well, that you think can mm-hmm. have some From sort your of, school? Who, who's that? I was watching the Patriots game last night, and we make fun of Greg because their fans sit on a throne of ease. They just keep getting better and better all the time. They got a guy in the third round, Chase Winovich. I'm sure you've watched him at Michigan, mm. oh, yeah. who has a motor the likes of which you just don't see. This guy's Rambo. He's up in the trees. He's in the cave. He's down by the riverbed. You're looking for him every play because the Titans want to get a good look at Ryan Tannehill, their yeah. fancy new backup quarterback. And Winovich <laughs> is single-handedly Reckon it. dismantling their entire offense for a whole stretch of the second quarter into the third quarter. You finally get him blocked because here's what guys are doing to Chase Winovich after he beats their right tackle and left tackle over and over again. Mm-hmm. They have a tight end suplex him or something, or the right tackle finally gets frustrated and throws, you know, picks him up and throws him, gets a holding Mm -hmm. penalty. They finally get done with that. They block him. Special teams, he tracks down the returner. This guy is everywhere on the field. Well, I would look at you, Brockman, uh, on your throne of ease. Um, to use the Chris Very Wrestling phrase right there. Very and, and comfortable. And I would say, I would say, I told you so, but you, 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 you met Winovich when he came here in studio, and, and when he and walked we out of here after he was guy. on the draft, you were like, okay. Let's get him. He's no joke. 
I mean, that was one of the best preseason performances I've ever seen, for what it's worth. I mean, he like <laughs> took, worth, he, right. he took it over. I, every year I give out a preseason MVP award, and there's two Patriots in the mix. I mean, Winovich and uh, Jared Stidham, they might have found kind of their next Jimmy G. They're the quarterback from Auburn. You believe, Ob- you believe Auburn. that? For I real? believe the reporters that are at practice that say he's far ahead of where Jimmy G or Jacoby Brissett were during their rookie years, that the day he showed up there, he was more accurate, kind of more together. And I think that's what you can get out of the preseason, just seeing which doesn't mean that quarterbacks that struggle early are going to struggle forever, but some that know what they're doing right away. And I would throw Daniel Jones into that mix, who can change the play, who can go to their third read, who can change tempo. Daniel Jones was doing that. Uh, during the second preseason game. That, like, that's next level, and that means they'll probably be playing sooner than later. That's Greg Rosenthal. And he's, uh, pardon me, sitting next to Chris Wesseling from the Around the NFL podcast right here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show from the NFL Media Group. And in case you're wondering, uh, Greg is, in fact, wearing uh, a seersucker sport coat uh, here <laughs> oh, on the I program. Noticed. I mean, if I'm if hey, I'm gonna good. go, my like in-laws, it. my father-in-law lives in Japan. Okay. If he's gonna buy me a seersucker, so what it. better place to wear it first than the Rich R- Eisen show? Atta boy, I. You know what? We are the home of seersucker uh, in the radio, <laughs> television, simulcast world. I just uh, want to buy an ice cream from you. No, uh, that's not very is. good. I like that response. Uh, rookie running backs. Give me one that you think that is going to be significant this year. Love David go. Montgomery from the Bears. Oh, everybody's on that train. Love right that now. guy. Um, he just seems like he was born to play running back. I know he's not Saquon Barkley as far as freakish physical skills. Right. But his instincts, his all-around game, his ability to make people miss but still run you over. Right. Um, maybe like slightly less tough, a little bit faster version of Eddie George. Mm. That's significant. I don't think he's quite like – I mean, Eddie George is probably the toughest running back I've ever seen. Right. So not quite that tough, but – but a, a good all-around back. What about you, Greg? Mm, I the one that sticks out is I'm now even forgetting his first name. Thompson from Kansas City. I think Darwin. Is Darwin Dom, Thompson from Kansas City, who's like a sixth-round pick. I think is going to get Carlos Hyde cut off that team. Well, mm. I mean, I, I was talking about this with uh, um, a diehard Kansas City Chiefs fan whose name rhymes with Schmone Street, <laughs> and you know, um, Hyde just seems like a total mismatch there. Like if you don't run four-four. And your name's not Travis Kelsey, then what are you doing on that team, right? Right. Isn't that basically what it is? And and they find these guys. I mean, Kareem Hunt was not someone that was highly thought of necessarily coming out. And just what they did with Damian Williams, it's a great place to be a running back. But that's what you can see in the preseason is the young running backs that have the lateral quickness. And he looks like someone that's going to be a factor. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if he is their starting running back, you know, by – mid-season or even before that, or if he ends up having a monster year. Because like Montgomery, he's with a coach that's going to know how to use him, and they don't care what guy, what round the guy was drafted in. Like, they might give him 200 touches. Don't you feel like this is Andy Reid's year, finally, <laughs> after 20-something oh years? <laughs> Chris Wesley. Why is that a laugh? I mean, it's, it's, it's because every year is Andy Reid's year. Finally, this is going to be Andy Reid's year. I Last like- year was Andy Reid's year. Until the AFC Championship. I mean, it was game Andy Reid's year just, if Bob Sutton in their defense hadn't blown it. I we, mean, you got a guy, a, a two, second year quarterback, getting the MVP, putting up 28 points in the fourth quarter against the Patriots, basically making the Patriots defense uh, fall apart at the end of that game. And if they win a coin toss, you know, they win the Super Bowl, I think. You, was, believe, you believe Mahomes can do it again? I mean, and by that, by that, I mean dominate because. As you know, the, one of the most adaptive, adaptive organisms in the history of adaptive organisms is an NFL defense. Mm-hmm. And you give an entire coordinating staff league-wide a year to study some film. I don't care how many times you throw with your left hand when you're right-handed. That's going to be an issue. You're nodding your head, Chris. I Wesley. always think of Dan Marino when this subject comes up okay. because if you said in 1985, of course, nice. you know, Dan Marino is going to throw for 50 touchdowns, you know. Right. He's mm. going to throw for 6,000 yards. You would have said, yeah, sure. And he never got better. The thing with, you know, Marino. <laughs> but he was one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Statistically never got better. But the thing with the Chiefs is they're so loaded. They're just so loaded with talent. They're even more loaded than last year. They keep reloading. And I just love how the narrative has changed. There's sort of an evolution of Andy Reid narrative. A few years ago, people are still making fun of his time management at the end of the game. Correct. And now half the league seems like they're Andy Reid disciples. Well, you got Nagy. You've got um, uh, obviously Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson and by by 
proxy Frank Reich. I mean, we could go down the list here. I mean, defenses might try to adjust, but they're not Andy Reid. I mean, Andy Reid is the most influential offensive coach of this century. I mean, I think he's the best offensive coach of this century. I don't think there's that many people in the NFL that would disagree with that. And especially if you look at the September, October that he's had the last couple of years, whether it was Alex Smith or Mahomes, he's so far ahead of the defenses because he spent the offseason changing what he's going to do. They're not going to just show up and be the same. And the difference now is he has Mahomes, who's you know one of the great young quarterbacks we've seen. What is that list of the great offensive minds this century? Uh, would Mike Shanahan be up there? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I that's mean, last. Well, I mean, that's kind of last century. Sean McVay is already there for me. I got one for you. Josh I'll, McDaniels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Sure. And by proxy, Bill Belichick. I'm serious here. That's the whole thing about this issue. And again, maybe it's because I got to spend two days with Bill Belichick on the NFL 100 series that's coming this fall. I, I, I mean, the, what this guy has done in the amount of football that he has seen, one of the only people who can actually match it in terms of the amount of football that they have seen this century is Andy Reid, right? right? And every single time they hit each other with the exception of a week one to open a season or something like that, right? I mean, when yeah, it comes down to it in the playoffs, and then there's TB12, if there is no degrading of his abilities if father time doesn't just suddenly pop up in week seven out of nowhere and sony michelle can do what he's doing with the rest of that offensive staff i don't care if there's no gronk i think he does show up at any point it's tough to not choose the patriots in the afc right now Mm. i can't push back on that i mean we doubt them all the time and every year they're smarter than everyone else they have that advantage. You know, I'm reading this book on Earl Weaver from the 70s. Had a boy, Chris Wessling. And just seeing the similarities <laughs> between him and Belichick, and they've crossed paths before So has, in Baltimore. Is that right? Did they, oh, it, it, with, Belichick used to work right outside of Earl Weaver's office offense when he was uh, March of Broda's assistant. No one's ever brought Colts. up Earl Weaver on this show. Come on. By the way, we have, we've talked to Earl Weaver before because one of the that greatest clip, videos yeah. of all time on YouTube is him getting ejected from a game in Memorial Stadium and as he is constantly going back and forth to get yet one last piece of the umpire who's ejecting him, who's mic'd up and hearing every last glorious blue streak word that's coming out of Earl Weaver's mouth, you could see on the scoreboard behind him, it's the top of the first. (laughs) <laughs> that's my favorite part about the world. we're showing it right here right on the screen how about that for you guys we got it we got the video for you you can see on the scoreboard screen it's 7 39 p.m at night these are the games and they started at 7 35 it's like it's, very fuzzy pre oh yeah you it's could great. see there's not even it's just the, the the tigers are in the field the tigers are at the plate and there's we can't even see how many outs there are. There might be just one out, and he's getting his piece of his mind. That's interesting that Belichick would have a history. Obviously, mm. Belichick's like Forrest Gump. For well, he's like a about. stopper. That's I feel bad for the the guys like Andy Reid, who I think is a Hall of Famer. Um, the people, how many titles would Peyton Manning have or, well, or uh, Tony Dungy? It's just, many, Reid would have two or three by now, and people would talk about him like. Well, I mean, exactly. You talk about the people who try to win in the Jordan era too. I mean, mm-hmm. the NBA. Uh, you've got Chris Wessling, and uh, I've got Chris Wessling, and and Greg Rosenthal from the Around the NFL podcast on on uh, on the Rich Eisen show right here. So, who's the NFC favorite? Give me one, Chris. Well, I, th- I think the Eagles, off the top of my head. Just they just so you're seen- on the Wentz train, huh? I saw it in 2017, you know. We've seen it before. He was he was MVP if he doesn't tear his ACL. So I, I know we've seen it happen. And they they seem as deep on both sides of the ball as any team in the NFL. The Eagles would have been mine early in the offseason. The problem is we we our podcast is three times a week. And by the end of the offseason now, we've talked about it for so long that I'm sick of everyone else picking the Eagles, and you just have to try to pick someone else. I think there's a group, though, and I put the Vikings in there. The Vikings – the Saints and the Rams, where it wouldn't be a surprise if any of those teams made the Super Bowl. But the Vikings are the one I feel like aren't getting as much attention for whatever reason. Adding Kubiak to that offense with a defense that you can't really keep together that long mm-hmm. in the salary cap era, but they have and is that talented, seem as primed as anyone. Another one of the best offensive minds of the 21st century, Gary Kubiak, who to me is a godsend for that team is exactly what they needed. What about the Cowboys? I would have said them as my number one. They're going to get everyone's son. If There's Zeke no way, was there and if get, their defensive line happen. wasn't so banged up, um, if you asked me, say, September 21st, I'll probably say the Cowboys. They just seem like a 12-win team to me. Mm. They do to me, too. 
They can't handle success. This has been a theory I've had for 15 years, and they <laughs> always make it true that they believe their own hype. Jerry Jones talks about how great they are. Like, they always believe that the year after they were good, like the year after they were the one seed in the NFC, they fell apart. Basically, every time they make the playoffs the next year, they fall apart. They haven't made the playoffs twice in the in the last, what, 20 years, twice in a row. It's been a long time, and I remember I last year— I feel like year, there's something unique about Dallas about that. Greg, I, I hear you, and I totally understand why you would say that and believe it, um, but— when Jerry Jones last year acquired Amari Cooper, we all laughed for a one. Literally. There really was were you 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 liked it, right, Chris? I loved it. Yes. You might be the only person in America who did. Uh, that not named Jones. I'm serious. They Ever. were so hard to watch without him that you could tell by watching them they need something to make this offense but if, go. But a one, but a one for him was uh, I think a lot of people. It was overpaying. Right. And like how crazy was he? Like a fox. And then he, when he said that we can be like the Rams offense, everybody, you laughed like we're over there, right there. I mean, yeah, because it's absurd. But you've got Dak and Goff. You've got Gurley and Zeke. You've got Amari Cooper now with, by the way, they, they, they have Randall Cobb. Who the hell knows what they're going to look with him? Michael Gallup's looking good. Right. And then. From the Rams offense from back in the day, Tavon Austin, who Stephen Jones said was going to get two dozen touches a game, which, by the way, math doesn't. It was a little bit fuzzy right there. But Do they have you, Sean McVay? Is he now coaching uh, the Cowboys? Let's see what Kellen Moore looks like. I love Kellen Moore. Okay. So I'm just saying every time everybody thinks Jerry's shot himself in the foot, and right now him saying Zeke who and Mort reporting that Rocky Arsenault, the agent of Zeke, is not laughing, and <laughs> Zeke's not laughing. I don't know. Maybe September 21st is when we should mm. revisit this. Thing. I understand the skepticism surrounding Jerry Jones' comments about Tony Pollard. Yes. The rookie. Yes. Behind a paywall at The Athletic, Will McClay, their senior VP, who's one of the best personnel men in the business. Yes. Raving about Tony Pollard. This is not a negotiation ploy. It's behind a paywall. They love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but so because it's behind a paywall, it wasn't planted. So I don't it, think it's planted. I like it. I like that mindset. All right, so uh, before I let you go, uh, Greg Rosenthal and Chris Wessling, three times a week we can hear you uh, with Hanses and Sessler on uh, on NFL Media Group podcast, which I can't believe we're saying. We were the first to plant the flag many, Absolutely. many years ago. Um, congrats on your success on all that stuff. Thank Thanks, you. Rich. You got it. Anything else I need to know from you guys before I let you go? We got Fabs on the show tomorrow. Mm. He's bringing a trophy that uh, of a league where he didn't even make the playoffs. Just, just if you don't want to ask the hard question, you could put it in my voice. Just like ask him, like how good is he really at playing fantasy? Like he's a good analyst. I feel but like it, I feel like I know how a lot he would, of leagues. I feel you, like you, I know how he would answer that question okay. with. Uh, he would find he'd find the disrespect in that. He'd be like, well, I was in 14 leagues last year, yeah, I and I made the finals in eight of them. And so. oddly enough, 13 with the Bella Twins. It's very strange. <laughs> you don't hear about the leagues he doesn't win. Fabs, by the way, we should change our team name to Michael Fabiano's Rolodex, and the Bella Twins should be our avatar in the league. <laughs> Just to troll on him. What do you think? We're thinking about it. I'm kind of into that idea. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, first overall pick in fantasy should be? I want to say Alvin Kamara. Okay, you're not afraid of the vulturing on the goal line? No. Latavius Murray's going to get the ball. Sometimes Taysom Hill's going to throw it into some guy I've never even heard of. He's going to score 12 touchdowns if he stays healthy no matter what, and okay. maybe more. But Gre I think Greg, think Greg would tell you he's the best running back in the NFL. I, I would agree, and I would take him first. You Like at that high a level in fantasy, just take the best player. Like he's much better. Every GM would take him over Christian McCaffrey. So do it if you're a fantasy owner too. Okay. Good to have you here at uh, Greg with two G's Rosenthal and at Chris Wessling, uh, both of you on Twitter. Thank you for being here in person. Thanks, say, Rich. Say Thanks, everybody Rich. up the, up the four Oh five. For more of the Rich Eisen show tune to audience channel 239 on direct TV for free on BR live or download the Rich Eisen show app.